Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today I'm really excited to introduce you to Arthur Mark Clark with The Princess and the Parakeet. You guys are going to love this. It comes in this beautiful box. And then it opens. To this. Mm. So exciting. And the story is so beautiful. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Oh, thank I you for having me. Loved it. I felt like a little girl getting a very special story. Uh, and then when I read it, it was so heartwarming. It was about friendship. It was about forgiveness. How did you come up with this? Oh, it's I, I love that that's the feeling you get from the book because it's the whole thing was filled with love. Um, I, I met this young girl when I was doing uh, writing one of my other books called The Royal Fables, uh, stories from the um, prince and, princes and princesses of Texas Children's Hospital. We spent time at Texas Children's Hospital as, asking children in their cancer centers to come up with a title for a prince or princess story. And I wrote stories based on their titles and they did the illustrations. One of the little girls I met there doing that book, her name was Brooke Hester, and she became my friend. And she was in New York when I was living there. Uh, she came for a special treatment at Columbia Presbyterian. And um, I went to visit her and said, Brooke, I brought you some of my new stories. Uh, I thought maybe I'd read to you. And she goes, really? I thought you came so I could give you another idea for a book. And I went, okay. She said, would you tell the story of the princess and the parakeet? And we talked for a while and decided that the, um, the parakeet was a, a prince who had been turned into a parakeet by a, uh, a sorcerer. And the, the sorcerer got so jealous that he turned green the skin turned green, and I went, okay, I could write that story. Um, so I wrote it and decided this would be my first novel. I'd only written fairy tales and short stories up until then. And uh, unfortunately, Brooke passed away before I finished the story. So I, uh, I made her the princess in the story and took all the names from people in her family as characters in it. And she had a foundation called Brooke's Blossoms, and so... After I finished it, all of the money from each hardcover book, $5 from each hardcover book goes to her foundation, Brooks Blossoms. And uh, everybody who worked on it, all the designers and, the, and all my friends and all the people who donated to have the book done, um, just filled it with love. So I'm hoping that her spirit comes through and that, and that people feel that love when they read it. They definitely feel the love. And it... It still makes me teary when I read that and I read the end of the book um, with the story about Brooke. Uh -huh. It was just so touching and I could understand how you related, how elements of the story relate that could have related to Brooke in general. Uh huh. Well, I'm, I gave her, I put her, um, she's under a curse as well, but she calls it a spell because <laughs> she looks at everything as positive, um, where she can never leave the castle. She can never go outside. So that sort of was an allegory-ish thing about her sickness. Um, right. But it, I just really tried to capture her spirit, and I hope that, that everybody who reads it feels that. I think she had a gift, and the gift, I hope, comes through this book you know, to other people. No, it definitely does because she's overcoming the spell. She makes a friend the same way that her mother had made a 
friend that added to her adversities that she was going through. And then just the whole journey, the adventure, the way the room was built, you could just imagine it. It's like the place that every girl wants in their life, especially when they're young. Actually, I still want it. But I mean, <laughs> I just loved it. I loved the storyline, the way that you wrote it. It flowed so well. I love the journey, the way that she finds a way to go around the spell. And just that the journey leads to, you know, where I, you know, where I think it, most people in that situation, when some thing, when you're restricted or you're confined, like now with COVID-19, you know, right. you have that, it was such a good book for this period in time too, you know, because that ability to just be free and just walk out the door without worrying about anything is taken away from her. So I think this is a good story, especially for, you know, the whole world going through this at this time. It really fit in well. Oh, I never thought of it that way. That's really, that's really great. She has a great um, thought because she spends all her time, a lot, so much time in the library that she goes, how silly that a sorcerer could think that they're keeping me in prison when I have the keys to the whole world right here in a book. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I was explaining this the story to, to a little girl in uh, Texas. I was visiting Texas uh, a month or so ago. And uh, I was telling her about the story. And I explained it different than I've ever had before. I was explaining how she, how Brooke, the princess, um, they have an argument, a running argument between the, their best friends, the parakeet and, and the princess. And they have this running argument about whether there's such a thing as fate or destiny. And she totally believes in it and, and loves the idea and the adventure of it. And he really thinks that, no, there's different events in your life and we like to picture them different ways to make us feel like we have this. But it turns out that she's right by the end of the story because it's, um, it's the threads of magic. It's, they were both um, under a spell from the same sorcerer, and that's what brought them together. That, that magic or bad magic is an interruption of nature, and that nature will right itself. And so nature or fate or destiny brought them together, and it brings other people who, are, who are, end up in the story together with them as well. They're all brought together for a reason, to fix what somebody destroyed in nature, sort of with bad magic. I know, I know, that's why it fits because I think it's, I, and I substitute at school, this is a book that I would have taken in from fifth grade down to kindergarten and discussed at, well, I definitely will after this event with COVID-19 uh -huh. because it's like, it fits all of the elements, the, the whole idea of being stuck inside. What did you do to pass the time? What did you do right. to make sure that your world was fuller and richer because of it? Did you read a lot? Did you read it as much as Brooke did? And then just the fact that the cautiousness that she had to use to like proceed out of the house, you know? Right. And they can relate to that with the COVID-19 because, you know, it's going to be a little nerve wracking, but I would just love to share with them to see their reaction to everything and because so many children will be able to relate to us. And it's so well done, Mark. It's just uh, you. filled with love. I loved it from beginning to end and I read it twice in the end oh. with rug. I was just crushed crush so how did you get into writing children's books um well it's i think in the best way i was telling somebody this story the other day some friends of mine um that uh it was uh, 10 years ago or more um and i went through a, a not very nice divorce and i didn't get to see my daughter or almost a year. 
And I was in therapy and the therapist said, you know how you always told me about the stories you used to tell Taylor when she was little? I go, yeah. He goes, maybe this is a good time to write those down because that'll give you some kind of connection to her when she's not here. And that's exactly what it did. I took stories that she liked. I made up new stories. I, I used names of her friends in the stories um, and parts of her personality for some of the princesses. And it was called and I put together 11 different stories called The Princess Fables. And I framed it around this time when she was six years old because Taylor was the absolute happiest little girl in the entire world. She sang and danced around the house all the time. Our friends would go, when I die, I'm going to come back as Taylor. And <laughs> so, but she came home from her first day of first grade and she was really upset. And I said, Taylor, what's wrong? She said, I thought you liked school. You loved being around teachers and, and students. And she goes, yeah, but they're making me work, learn all day. And she started crying because it, it destroyed her world. Her world was all happiness. And now it was all learning. And uh, so she didn't want to go to school in the morning. So I'd go and wake her up and go, Taylor, come on, you have to go to school. And she'd go, I don't want to. And i go, go, oh, Taylor. Did I ever tell you the story of the princess who always said, I don't want to? She said, no. So I made up a story about a princess who said, I don't want to all the time and learned how to say, I want to. And, and she'd forget that she didn't like school and she'd run off to the bus. But the next day, the same thing would happen. I go, Taylor, you have to get out of bed. We have to go to school. And she'd hide under the covers. I go, oh, Taylor, did I ever tell you the story of the princess who hid under the covers? She go, no. So I'd make up another story of another princess. So it was like 11 different stories of what she might do or say to get out of going to school. And it's, that's how it started. Wow. Um, Were you always a writer? Um, I think. In high school, I, I started writing. I was in a, um, uh, like an alternative high school for my final year. And instead of an English class, I took a class on Kurt Vonnegut and Richard Brodigan. And uh, for my final, instead of a, uh, a test, I wrote, uh, I read everything Kurt Vonnegut had written. And uh, I wrote the story of his life and like kind of an autobiography of him, the wit in his style. And that was the first time I went, Oh, I really like this. I really like how this feels. So I started writing screenplay or I started writing plays for the theater because I was raised by actors and I did that for 10 or 15 years. Then I started writing screenplays and I did that for another 10 or 15 years, but I never thought of myself as an author or a writer. Um, I thought I could write dialogue and action and, and things, but real writers write books. So I never thought of myself as that. So 10 years ago, I took a shot at it and I love it. It's like my favorite thing to do. Wow. And how many books have you, children's books have you written since then? Um, I published five, um, mostly collections. This is the first novel I wrote and I have about, five or six um, manuscripts that are unpublished right now and tons of stories. I just came up with a, I'm writing a story right now that I just came up with a few days ago. I thought I didn't have a story about COVID-19 and until I figured out some kind of fairy tale version of it and I just did the other day. Oh, mm. wow. <laughs> so with the princess and the parakeet, is it another series or will it be another princess after her? Um, I think, I, I thought it was just a book um, at the, at like one, one novel. Um, when I was finishing it, uh, I had, I worked with two editors. One is my dad. And um, when we got near the end, I said, well, let's, what can we cut? What would we get rid of? If you thought there might be a second book, what would you get rid of? So we got rid of, a whole chapter or two that was at the end. Um, and I thought, Oh, someday I might write another one. And then, um, I try to work every day out of inspiration instead of motivation. And one day I had an inspiration and just a total download and wrote out what the next book would be and a lot of the stuff that happens in it and what a third book would be. So I think it's going to be a trilogy at some point. 
I just haven't started those um, yet. <laughs> I have so many stories to tell. It's just amazing. You must have a big heart because the end of this book, it's you finally get to the bad guy. You understand everything that he's done and it's horrible, you know, really horrible, but written in a way that children can understand. But her choice on how she was going to deal with him was so good. It was, I haven't seen that ending, um, but it made sense, you know, and, you know, sometimes you're just, you know, you have to make people accountable and give them the ability for redemption. Right. Like, yeah, she didn't. It's no easy redemption. Um, and she's yeah. such powerful at the end. She's a powerful person. And I think that's what the rest of the stories will be about how her how she starts to deal with her power and um, when she becomes queen. Um, so I can't remember the titles what, of the what the next ones will be. I think the next one is, I can't remember. <laughs> um, I have so many stories in me. I just, uh, it's hard for me to keep them in. Does she marry the parakeet? Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, they're best friends. <laughs> they're the best I know. Friends. That was so wonderfully put together too. The, how the friendship developed and how she, how it was okay for her to be a strong lead in that relationship. And it's just yeah. a strong female. Yeah, for all the right reasons too, I think. You know, Definitely. I, it's strength that she has to learn and earn too. Like physically, she's not, she has to learn these lessons. Um, yeah, I like that. <laughs> but what I loved about it is that I've grown up reading every fairy tale imaginable in so many different countries. And with Disney, I always feel like, you know, I think I have to go to the gym to be more like Cinderella or to have that small hourglass waist like Cinderella. But with this story, I felt so good in my skin. Like I felt like I could be me and I could just grow up to do the things that I wanted to do, like Brooke. Mm -hmm. you know? But it makes That's me cry when I think about it because Brooke didn't get to do all those things. Uh, it, it's, it's, a. Uh, she, she changed my life. So, um, I'm trying to live up to the gift that she's given me to pass along to other people. And I tell this to kids. I visit a lot of schools and classrooms and, and tell Brooke's story and they go, that's really sad about Brooke. I go, it, it is sad, but something I've learned is that something can be heartbreakingly beautiful. And that's what her story is. And she gets to, I talk to her mom all the time. And Brooke stays alive because of this story and because everybody, I, every child I tell, she's still alive in them. So she still makes her mom proud. You know, uh, that's great, but it is a wonderful story that would make young girls and boys. I mean, boys, like it's okay to show empathy. It's, it's okay to understand your friends and talk to girls, just that whole development of the conversation around it. It was oh, so inspiring. I really loved it. Uh, thank you. I, I, I love these characters so much. It's a, it's an amazing thing to be able to do, to get to a place in writing where you're not really writing anymore. Your characters are so complete. I could put them in those two people, those two characters in any situation and they would just talk. They, I don't, all I have to do is it got to a point where I was just trying to keep up with them. Like I'm trying to write down the things that they said because they were so strong a personality already. 
and we cut out chapters of stuff where they would just run around and do stuff on their own. And, and my editor would go, you don't really need that. It doesn't advance the plot. And I go, I know, but they were having so much fun. <laughs> you have to publish that separately. But that was just amazing and heartwarming and victorious and all of those emotions you dragged us through. I couldn't put it I, down. I, uh, you, this is, you're so sweet. <laughs> That's such no, nice I'm thing serious. To say. I couldn't put it down. And it, it, it takes a lot for me to love children's books these days. There's so many and they're so like, it's kind of a letdown because you know, you grow up with Grimm and Disney and all that. And those are great stories. And he really did a great job at twisting them and making them good stories. But, you know, when you look, this is such a good book to compare it to because, honestly, The Princess made me feel good about me and the choices that I would make in the same situation where, you know, some of the other princesses that we've read about, you really want to look like them more, you know, like, oh, huh. you know, like, okay, if this is going to be work, like more work <laughs> than I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah I don't know how you get into your characters heads the way you do but it was just so inspiring well it's really great uh, the same thing happened with the other main characters that um, when I was rewriting at the end I rewrote this book a lot um, and it got to a point where I was writing a new scene and characters would insist on being in the scene, even though I, the scene wasn't about them. They go, well, they were so strong. Um, there's a, the, the witch in it, who's the fire witch. She like pushed her way into scenes that I didn't intend for her to be in. It's like when your characters get to be that strong, they, are, they go, you can't write a scene without me in it because I'm still around and I have stuff to say and stuff to do. And, it's such a, a great place to be. I, uh, I love it so much. I love, I just love writing so much because I, a friend helped me. Uh, she's a, um, she's writes self-help books and also shepherds people who write books for the first time. So she's kind of a part therapist, part book shepherd. So she helps you discover who you are in the process of writing your book. So by the time you're done, you could go and speak anywhere because you're so sure of yourself and what your what your message is. Um, she helped me design my morning so that mm -hmm. I can write from inspiration, and and it, it's like such a gift to be able to write in that way. It is, and you've been recognized for it. You won best children's book at the London Book Festival. That was so much fun. Really? And, and, yeah. and there's other awards, too, wasn't there? Um, it won Best Book uh, Cover um, at the Southern California Book Festival. Um, oh. and, a, and a reader's favorite, too, I think. Yeah. I know. I love the cover. It was like a puzzle. Oh, oh it was so you much know. fun to do. Oh, it was like when I first get it, you're looking at it like, oh, it's pretty, it's colorful, it's busy. But then right. you read it, and then you go back to open it where you left off, and you're like, oh, oh, they're all here. I get it. <laughs> it was yeah. just, oh, I love that. It was like, you know, those picture finds. Yes, that's what I, that's, it, it turned out exactly how I wanted it to be. I just love a cover where the more you read, the more you see in the cover, and um, the more you look at it, the more you see as well. When I take it to, to uh, students, I have them look at the, there's one corner of the book that is sort of black and white, and it's dark, and I go, this cover is beautiful, not just because of flowers, it's because it has the light and the dark, and the more you look into the darkness, you'll see snakes and spiders and you'll see a skull that's hidden in a flower and things like that. So it's, um, it's full 
and and the more so the more you look the more you see the more you read the more you see so i love how it turned out oh i love that analogy mm -hmm. so what's next for you um well my one of my favorite manuscripts that's finished right now is a retelling of sleeping beauty it's called veiled reflections the dawn of sleeping beauty in this version of the story when sleeping beauty when the princess is awakened after a hundred years sleep all of her muscles have atrophied so she can't speak and she can't control her muscles and somehow she's linked to this girl in within her dreams um, who wakes up from a coma in modern times with cerebral palsy and she can't speak or control her muscles so they share each other's dreams and they also share each other's uh, uh, challenges and struggles but one's in a fairy tale and one is in modern day life and you can never really tell who is the dreamer and who's the dream Oh, that sounds amazing. I can't wait for it to come out. When it's do you so expect I don't know. I'm going to go a traditional route with it and find a, a, a publisher. So uh, I don't know how long. Um, it's, well, keep me it's updated. So, <laughs> you can read it if you want. <laughs> oh, I'd it's love really, to. It's, mo it's a little more young adult adult than it is uh, children's because um, there's just – I try to – um, give myself challenges that I don't know how to fix, like problems that I don't know how to solve. Um, I used to say I, I'd write myself into a corner. Um, on, in this one, one of the things that I did was uh, the prince who saves, uh, who goes to save or rescue, wake up the princess. Um, in order to get through the enchanted forest, he is given, uh, he has to battle the seven deadly sins in in reality or in in a fairy tale so i had to come up with that's how he proves that he has the seven virtues worthy of waking the princess and worthy of her love so i had to come up with how do how do the seven deadly sins present themselves in what kind of nightmare or what kind of monster um so those kind of things uh, it, i just love it and the two girls become best friends and they can speak to each other because it's just through their thought and they speak to each other through mirrors or glass I'm so, for some reason I'm uh, mirrors and glass are, are like a big theme for me at this time in my writing life so they talk to each other through glass and in the third act of the book or near the end the um, the girl in modern times has been in an accident and she and she's on her deathbed and goes into depression and the princess um, can't see her in the mirror anymore can't reach her so she has to do the scariest thing she's ever done which is go back into the darkness because she spent a hundred years in the dark and now she has to choose to go into the dark glass to find her friend and rescue her um. oh, that sounds <laughs> great well, and I think after had, this yeah. book, I've grown up just enough to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was so enjoyable. And I love the back um, where it says, believe in fairy tales. They teach us right from wrong, good from evil. Oh, it's so good. I don't want to give it all away, but thank mm. you for such an inspiring read. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. It's so nice to talk to you, too. Um, oh, I have heard this kind of thing. It's, it's such a great idea, too, that um, that this is a story for our time right now. I should reach out and let people know that. And thank you for helping share it, too. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for being here. And if you guys want a great book to read, The Princess and the Parakeet will take you away to places that you never dreamed existed. We'll see you soon.